Right now, we got Frank Close, Philly's mailbag. Final stretch of the season. Last week of games. Doesn't help that they're falling apart, leaking oil here. But they are getting Bryce Harper back in right field today. They do have JT Riamuto behind the plate for Aaron Nola. Disappointing, though, to lose last night with Wheeler on the mound. But we got the mailbag. A lot of questions this week for Frank. And, Frank, before we jump into all the mailbag questions here, I do want to get some thoughts on from you. If the Phillies even make the playoffs, which is an if at this point, there's a possibility that you won't see Wheeler or Nola pitch in the playoffs. Is that true? Uh, I'm sorry, say that again. If they, if they, if do they make, make the, playoffs, the playoff, there is a good possibility that you wouldn't see Wheeler or Nola pitch in the playoffs because you're going to probably need them on Saturday and Sunday just to help you get to the playoffs. Yes, that's a that's a very very good point. You know, looking at the schedule, even a few weeks ago, like I guess when the month began, I was really trying to track who was going to pitch when, uh, and those two lined up to be the last two games, which. If you're trying to squeeze into a playoff spot, they're the guys you want to have on the mound to get in. But then once once you get in, that's that's kind of a problem because you have Matt Gafflin and then question mark. <laughs> so um, you know you can easily see the Phillies losing one of those quick rounds because they don't have either of their top two arms to go with, go to battle with. So I think that they that's a real possibility that if they do squeeze into the playoffs because the two of them pitch phenomenally the last two days then they might be out before either of them gets the ball. Absolutely. Right. I mean, so you have Wheeler scheduled to pitch Saturday, and Nola would pitch on Sunday, the final day of the regular season. And if you are not locked into a playoff spot, you're going to have to use Nola on that day. The playoffs would start on Tuesday, and there's no day off. So essentially, you would be going into the playoffs with Eflin Velazquez, I guess, right? At least for the first two games, if you were to win one of those two games, game three, maybe you get Wheeler back on short rest. I don't know that they would even do that, to be honest with you. I mean, given 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 Wheeler's issue with his fingernail, I, I don't think that they would start somebody on short rest, unless for some reason you know Wheeler takes the mound in that in that game and the Phillies go up fifteen to nothing really fast, and then they feel like they can you know get it out of there so they can save him. But I, I don't I don't see how how they can even try that right now, given the fact that he I don't think he's ever pitched on short rest and. Um, I don't know that wants to be that, that would be the time that you try to do that. Yeah, that would be disappointing though if you didn't get to see Aaron, for me at least Aaron Nola is the guy that I really want to see pitch in the postseason. But this question kind of goes perfectly with the first question of your mailbag. And is Zach Eflin a bona fide number three starter behind Nola and Wheeler? And would that give them a good chance to actually win the first game of a series if he's the one pitching? See, I look at Zach Eflin, I, I see him more as a four or five on a really good team. You know, you know thinking back to the, the Phillies past and, and really good rotations, you know, someone like Joe Blanton was somebody that would be a perfect, like, fifth starter in a really good team because, you know, he gives you some games where he's actually really good. And, you know, like Zach Eflin, he pitched that seven inning shutout in that first game of the doubleheader on Friday. Uh, but then there's also games like like Zach Eflin had against the Marlins where he only gives you four innings at a very crucial day, and those four innings he gave up four runs. I mean, that, that's not going to cut it, having a 9 ERA in some of your starts. Uh, so I, I think Eflin is not consistent enough to be counted on as a number three. So moving forward, I think the Phillies need to find somebody behind Nola and Wheeler that's a little bit more reliable, a little bit more consistent, and hopefully somebody who – who can come in and be what Jake Arrieta was hopefully going to be for the Phillies and be one of those solid ones in the rotation that, that could be your number three starter. So that, that didn't happen this year, and I think that I think the Phillies will have to find somebody that slots ahead of Eflin going into next year for that rotation. How about this? How about someone who goes before Aaron Nola, and then Nola's your two and Wheeler's your three? I think that is more like it. <laughs> Uh, uh, where do you find that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm right. gonna say, Garrett, Garrett, Garrett Cole already signed with the Yankees, so I don't know. I don't know how you're going to do that. Yeah. Um. Well, either way, you slice it. If the Phillies make the playoffs uh, under these, uh, you know, Eflin possibly being your number three, which means he would be your number one in a playoff situation. Because look, because the Phillies have played so poorly down the stretch. I mean, they had that nice little stretch of games, nine out of ten, but after that, they really kind of fallen apart. They had a nice little three game streak going against the Blue Jays, which put them in the spot that they're in now, uh, but because they have really had a scratch and claw their way to the finish line here, and they still have a 
even clinched anything, there's a good possibility you could make the playoffs and not have your top two starters pitch in that. Now, today JT Real Muto is in the lineup. He will catch in the first game. But do the Phillies have, you know, number one, let me ask you this. How confident are you that the Phillies will do everything in their power to get him back? And do they have a plan B if, in fact, they say, you know what, he's asking for too much money, we're going to go in this direction? You know, we've talked about this a lot in the last year, and and the more time goes on, the less likely I think it is the Phillies are going to have him back. And I I don't think it's because they want him back, but I think ultimately they're going to hit a a point where – giving Real Muto the deal he's going to get is either a really bad idea or if it's a good idea, of course, they, they'll, they'll do it. But I just see I just see too many other teams out there that, that, that are more desperate. Uh, you know, the New York Mets keep coming up as, as somebody that, that could make a big move now that they have a new billionaire owner coming into the fold, perhaps, and, and trying to, to make a, a big move. Um, I'm kind of at the point where I, I, I think he's going to get seven years uh, and I think he's going to eclipse the $26 million a season that, that's kind of been the record for a catcher to this point. So, I, see, I mean, if the deal is 7 and 185 do you really want to sign somebody who will be 36 <laughs> the last year of that deal? That, that I'm not really sure. So, so I don't think it's, it's – I don't think – put it this way. I, I think it's better to have JT Real Muto than not have him. Uh, but if you, if you don't end up with that deal – then I think here's what you need to do. If, if it ends up not being a good deal, you had better make really <laughs> real certain that you bring in people on that roster that will make your team better in other areas. Now, when you, when you kind of look at everybody who's departing, Jake Arrieta's $25 million annually is going to come off the books. Then you're going to see uh, Didi Gregorius is $14 million will. I mean, although they might like to resign him too. Uh, you'll see that the the 12 million a year that Dave Robertson has been getting will come off the books. Uh, Vince Velasquez made 3.6 million. That's going to exit the books. So when you kind of add up all this money that that's freeing up at the end of the year, and you look at the uh, landscape, what trades you could make. If if you don't have Real Muto, your plan B needs to be to improve at other positions. And it can't be a catcher because you just simply can't do any better at catcher. And I think that's the reality of it. So what happens in the wake of JT Real Muto perhaps leaving needs to be judged by the greater picture. Whoever catches will not be as good, and that's very, very clear. So they really need to make sure they're spending their money wisely, making strategic trades, even if some of them are uncomfortable. You know, maybe maybe they have to trade somebody you like, uh, but they, they need to make sure at the end of the day – that the entire roster is better overall if they lose JT Romuto behind the plate because there's no replacing JT Romuto behind the plate. I would love to get your thoughts on Matt Klentak's comments yesterday. He said, we would love to have JT, but when you make that trade, you're trading for two years of control, and you know that. So Sixto looked really good against us. He's looked good this year, but we had two very productive years with JT as well, and obviously that just doesn't sit right with me at all. You know, the thing I don't necessarily like about those comments is both years it seems like the Phillies stop short of going above and beyond to make sure that they win. You know, this this year was obviously the bullpen where they thought they would just, you know, flop together some, uh, I don't know, Band-Aids and rubber bands and, and they would have a bullpen. But, you know, the previous year it was the starting pitching. You knew you needed starters, and they just they didn't bring anybody in. You know, they went for, they went for – uh, really, the scrap heap to, to find. You remember last year, Drew Smiley was somebody that came up. In fact, uh, the other guy, uh, Marcus from the Mets, right? I mean, they, they they didn't really go all out to, to try to to fill out the roster completely. And if you were trading for Real Muto, you're spending all that money on Harper. I'm just surprised they didn't go the last step in either season. If 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 they're believing that. You know, the price to pay for JT Romuto for two years was six of six to Sanchez. I mean, that's essentially what it's going to come down to. Six years of six to Sanchez for two years of JT Romuto. I would have liked to see them try a little bit harder for the two that they had him. Speaking of which, Matt Klenczak, if he were to be let go, any uh, candidates out there that uh, excite you? And what about Andy McPhail? Um, why is he? I mean, there was a report from the Athletics' Ken Rosenthal that suggested 
that Klintak needs a deep um, run here. Now, we know he signed an extension with the COVID. The Phillies, have, by the way, this kind of got swept under the rug, that they're asking a lot of full-time employees to take buyouts uh, because of what's going on here. So uh, do you end up cutting ties with your GM when you just gave him an extension? Well, at the end of the day, this is a performance-oriented business, and if the job's not getting done, then the job's not getting done. And I, and I, and I think – I think that McPhail needs to be part of this conversation as well. You know, you've had five and a half years. You have a payroll that I just, according to Sport Track, is at 214 million, which means they exceeded the luxury tax this year, uh, and actually are going to are going to be penalized for it. You need you need more results than that with all that time to to, to bring about talent and with all that money. Like, but like, like, there's no reason that somebody in that position shouldn't be able to get it done with that payroll. So. And it really, it falls on uh, McPhail. It falls on Clintac too. I mean, what what I what I think should happen is somebody like Dave Dombrowski, and and then I've, I've seen Kevin Cooney, you know, for the show. He's mentioned that name before. Dave Dombrowski come in, fresh set of eyes, and sort of be the Pat Gillick that sort of like makes the last few moves. I mean, you remember when Pat Gillick came into the Phillies? You know, he kind of saw what was there, saw where the strengths were, and just found a few pieces around the edges to sort of round it out. And, and there you had your championship within just a few years of him arriving. So I think I think Dave Dombrowski would kind of be the best served to do that role um, since he's no longer with the, with the Red Sox, but he built a World Series champion team there. He was with some of the really good Expos teams before things fell apart in Montreal, then the Marlins for championships, and then up in Detroit. So he's got a good track record. I would I would say someone like him should be the president and GM at the same time, take care of the baseball operations and write the ship and be ready to have somebody to, to succeed him in a couple of years. Isn't so that, that's that, what I would do. What was the reasoning McPhail was brought? Wasn't he, like, I mean, was it them, like, trying to recreate Pat Gillick, getting, like, an old baseball guy who had, you know – some success in the past, You're like, hey, let's just try to recreate that. I, I mean, w- w- what does McPhail do? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I, I'm actually really surprised. I remember even one game a couple of years ago. I'm, I'm there with, with with my family, just attending as a fan, and and he just walks straight through the concourse and goes up the escalator unnoticed. <laughs> you know, and I think that was a good analogy for his his tenure as president. I mean, it, it, you know. As he said when he got hired, he said, I, "I'm not being hired for my marketing acumen." Right? So, kind of saying, "Well, I'm I'm coming to be your president with with an idea on the baseball operations." And and we did see. Um, I, I, I apologize, I'm drawing a blank on his name, but the one executive kind of took more of the financial role as sort of a vice president role. Um, but uh, you know, he he was here to be a baseball guy, and so. I, I think he does bear a lot of that responsibility. I mean, he went with a guy that worked for him in Baltimore and Matt Clentac, and uh, you know that this is Clentac's first GM rodeo, and I'm sure a lot of what he's doing is is uh, under the guidance of the president. But um, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, if he was brought in to turn things around, and they're not turned around in five and a half years. I, I, I definitely, I definitely have to question whether or not he's he's the best fit for this organization right now because you know what sometimes, sometimes the old wise one is is not is not um, I want to say uh, or maybe a little bit out of touch of the new ways or I mean I thought Clintac was trying to was the one to try to to, to be that foil but um, in, a, in a way too you know the, the uh, hiring of Joe Girardi I mean that seemed to be a departure from what they were kind of building anyway. You know, they were they were trying to be the the on the edge or the cutting edge, you know, with the Gabe Kapler hire, and of course that didn't really pan out for them. So, um, so, so you got to wonder if if there were if the Girardi hire even came from above, like the Bryce Harper signing came from above, you know, the ownership to really push this in a direction, uh, another direction. But but yeah, he's he he's got to be uh, responsible for some of it. Were they trying to reinvent Pat Gillick? I don't know if they were trying to reinvent Pat Gillick, but. They won somebody when they hired McPhail that that had a pedigree in the game, and you know, with his work with the with the Cubs and the the Orioles, and um, growing up in the Twins organization, basically, you know, that they thought that he would be that guy. Well, um, we'll see. I mean, do you think uh, it takes a deep playoff run? Do you think they're in trouble anyway, regardless of what happens here? I mean, or uh, is it all up in the air? 
really, really hard to say. I, I, you, you know, that I don't, I don't know if simply getting to the playoffs will make a difference, and I don't really know how deep. I don't know how deep they can go. I mean, let's let's let's, let's be honest. I mean, depending on how the seeding goes, I mean, they could face the Padres or the the Dodgers right off the bat, and I just think they'll get trounced by either team. So it, well, right it, now it's they're the eight be, seed. Right now they'd be eight. Yeah, right, right now. But I, honestly, before before worried about being a wild card, I think the Phillies' best chance is to play better than the Marlins these last few days and be the second team. Because well, if you know if you're, if you're in second place, you're in. I think that's that's going to have to be how the Phillies get in. So. Mm-hmm. A lot of a lot will depend on you know I, the people that are breathing down their necks. Like for example, yesterday they went in uh, with the Reds and Brewers playing each other, and the Reds and Brewers were 500 teams. Well, if they're playing each other, then one of them's got to be above 500 when this is over, right? So um, it, it's going to be really tough. And the Marlins, the Marlins don't have a, an easy week. The Marlins play the Braves, and then they play the Yankees. And uh, I can see the Braves kind of taking care of business against the Marlins the rest of the series. And then the Yankees, you know, the Yankees are still fighting for their life. And I think they're better than the Marlins. So can the Phillies do okay and hold their own against the, uh, against the nationals in these three games in tomorrow and against the Rays, uh, who, who might actually be uh, set up for the playoffs by then um, that, that will kind of tell the tale, but but just getting in, I, I just don't know how far they're going to be in a position to go. Yeah, probably not very far, especially if they need Wheeler and Nola Saturday, Sunday, just to get in. He's Frank Close. Of course, you could check out the Phillies mailbag at 97.3 ESPN.com. And if the Phillies make the playoffs, of course, we will continue uh, to take a look at this team at the final week of the regular season. Man, it came in a blink of an eye uh, last week of the Phillies. A little sad there, Broads? Absolutely. Come on. You know me. I need to react to something. <laughs> Frank Close, like all guests, appeared via the Boardwalk Honda hotline. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, guys. Man, a blink of an eye, this thing is over.